Welcome to the Nonprofit Show. We're glad you're here. And today we have back with us Dana Skurlock from Staffing Boutique. One of the Staffing Boutique ladies joins us each and every month. And we're so glad to have Dana here today to talk to us about what it's like to vet your nonprofit staff candidates. So she's got a plethora of information and insight and wisdom to share with us. So I'm excited to learn from you, Dana, because this is an area of expertise that I don't usually play in. So it's really good to get your professional insight on this. And we also want to remind you who we are. Thank you to Ooh. Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. So grateful that you created this platform. You know, yesterday was episode 850. So today is 851. We are marching fast towards that 900. I know, Dana, I see your eyeballs and they're getting big, my friend. Like, yes. <laughs> Amazing. And again, thank you for allowing me to serve alongside you, Julia, as your co-host. I'm Jarrett Ransom, the nonprofit nerd and CEO of The Raven Group. We have showed up day in and day out. Thank you also to our amazing presenting sponsors that also show up right alongside us for these conversations. So thank you to Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, where Dana joins us from, also Nonprofit Nerd and Nonprofit Tech Talk. I like to invite you to please check out these companies. They're not only here for us in these conversations during the episode, but they're here for you and your mission to help you do more good in, around, and throughout your community. I mentioned 850 episodes marching towards 900 and you are in luck, my friend, because you can find them. If you download the app, you can scan the QR code right now. Thank you, Vanna White, and see that QR code. You can scan that, download the app, and you'll receive uh, a notification in just a couple of hours that our conversation we're about to have with Dana Skurlock has been uploaded and available to you. We're also on podcast and broadcast platforms, and you can find us just about anywhere you consume your information. Uh, not quite yet, uh, you know, the newspapers. I don't think we're going to go to the newspapers, <laughs> but we're still working on the hologram, um, which, gosh, maybe that'll happen soon. <laughs> it's close. I mean, you can, it's got to be. Yeah, because you can um, speak into your remote if you have a smart TV and just say the nonprofit show and we pop up and it's a little jarring because most smart TVs are enormous, yeah. right? So, I mean, yeah, we will show up. We're on your sofa next to you. <laughs> well, we're excited again to have you back with us, Dana. Uh, for those of you watching and listening, maybe this is your first time uh, learning about Dana. She is the director of recruitment at Staffing Boutique. Again, I mentioned she and Katie, uh, they, join, they join us um, each and every month, and they have brought to the conversation so much wisdom, so much experience. Mm -hmm. I am so grateful for you and Katie to continuously share your time and expertise with us. So welcome back. Well, thank you so much for that lovely intro. It's always a pleasure to be here with you guys. And I love our conversations. It's really uncovered. It makes it keeps us both sharp, I think, for us to share what yes. Katie and I have experienced over our, our years of recruiting and then also hear, you know, bounce ideas off of each other. It's really, it, it just enhances our business as well. So it's wonderful being with you. Well, Thank good. You. you know, when I think about you, Dana, um, and your, your team over at Staffing Boutique, you seem to be one of the companies that you've been in the middle and it, you've of this whole pandemic and you've had to embrace change and be yeah. super flexible. And when we talk about things, when we talked about things in the beginning, they are completely different than what we're talking about now because of, of the, the ecosystem of, of the pandemic. And so yeah. it's been really interesting to hear from you and, and to hear from our viewers and listeners about what their questions are because things are changing now. So oh yeah. So quickly. And now we're in this like, you know, big push, of course, we've been talking about labor shortages and all that, but then things are kind of changing yet again a little bit. And we're to the point now where we can even talk about recruiting strategies and background checks, which I got to say, Jared, it seemed to me we were like, Brock, background checks, get them in. We don't have time, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, and I still feel we can't get people in fast enough. Yeah. So, I agree. I agree. You know, 
I, I mean, this is an issue that I've seen just anecdotally from other people that are in other industries. I have someone close to me who works in securities and just at a location that you have to do a lot of background checks for. And the issue of staffing shortages, people sort of not being committed to jobs, leaving with no notice. It's a lot of money, time and effort to do the background checks for people to not last very long in the job or never make it to the finish line once they've been offered the job to then start. Um, and so and I see those things. It's great that you guys saw that staffing boutique and that's a testament to Katie being so flexible and willing to change and adapt with the time so quickly. I think that's been a blessing for us that she is a leader that leans that way. It's also helpful that we're a lean staff. You know, there's only five of us. So making those maneuvers has been a lot simpler. I, I feel very much um, compassion for large institutions that are having to make these really sharp turns. And it's very difficult when you're employing 500 people to make those types of changes. And so I think sometimes, you know, and I think people listening today even may hear some of the things that I'm describing and say, that's great. Don't know if I can do that though, because I've got myself a team of 10 people that work under me and then the overall organization has a few hundred people. So, you know, I, I am sensitive to that as well. Yeah, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. And I know that, you know, still in, in a lot of sectors, but I want to say predominantly the nonprofit we maintain the, this is the way we've always done it. And I'm still seeing that through the interview process. And again, I know that you and Katie have brought a lot of insight so we can go back and watch a lot of the previous episodes, you know, but really looking at, okay, this person needs to have this conversation with this person first, and then they move to this conversation with this person. And then by the time you like maybe get to an offer, it's been weeks, maybe months, yeah. it's been hours, maybe days, you know, mm -hmm. like we're really putting a lot into it. So let's dive deep because today we're going to talk on really three main topics of um, background checks, drug testing, and references. So let's start with that background check. Um, and I'm curious, can this also be viewed as discriminatory? What what are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, uh, what I would say is that, number one, I completely agree with hiring managers. There has to be some sort of concrete vetting process just to, you know, make sure that they're covered legally on their end when they're bringing people in with with access to proprietary donor information, mm -hmm. proprietary financial information about the organization. Um, I would say everyone from the administrative staff to certainly the fundraising and finance team, which we, you know, at Staffing Boutique, we place all different types of roles within the nonprofit sector. All of those roles are gonna be privy to a lot of important and sensitive information. Yeah. And so I encourage, you know, hiring managers, especially when it comes to those types of roles um, where they're gonna have a lot of access to those things to absolutely do a background check. Not even that the background check necessarily is going to bring back anything that would, you know, preclude being able to hire somebody. Obviously it will, if, if that's back in their background, you will be able to spot check that. But most people don't have anything bad in their background, you know, or if they do, they know. <laughs> and so they're going to probably, you know, like let you know before you run it, if you're telling them that they're going to be, you know, have a background check. I think it's also just about liability so that you can at least have on the record, we went through all of, you know, we, we crossed all our T's and dotted all our I's in terms of hiring. Um, so that if something were to go awry, you you did follow protocol. Yeah, so yeah. I'm not, you know, I, I view none of this with any sort of ire towards like background checks being not useful or important. Um, I would say that the depth of some background checks can be viewed as discriminatory, particularly when it skews towards like credit checks, things right. that are more personal. Okay. Um, there have been a few, I mean, not a few, there's been a lot of pushback, at least in New York City anywhere. I'm, I'm in the heart of Manhattan. So what I'm hearing a lot about are um, recently, for example, they made it illegal for us to ask um, what your previous salary was, because what they found throughout the studies was that the wage gap between men and women continued to be divisive yeah. in part because women had traditionally been getting paid less and the biggest determinant of what your new salary would be would be what you've been paid before and so they found that it's just we're just perpetuating the cycle so now we had to change our entire um you know conversation with candidates from the moment one where we're removing that question and more fine letting them lead as to what salary they're looking for so 
obviously that's a separate issue from background checks, but it's a similar issue with, you know, doing background checks that dig deep into their personal lives. If you're considering, it it could be considered like, are you looking at whether I'm married as a factor? Are you looking at, you know, my credit score? And when I first started recruiting, I would get asked to run credit checks on people often. I have not in the past, I would say two to three years, certainly before the pandemic. And I think part of it is that there is some backlash in terms of like employment law, um, led by the candidate side, you know, saying, why is that relevant? What, you know, why are you dinging my credit just to get a job? How can I get out of debt? Because really, what are you looking for in a credit check other than whether the person's in debt? And yeah. the theory was, if they're in debt, they're more likely to either commit fraud or mm-hmm. try to, you know, siphon money out of an account or something like right. that. I personally am kind of of the the mindset of like, people are going to do it if they're that type of person, not necessarily how much money they have um, in the bank. However, that was a theory for why you were checking credits. Now, that then, I think, at least in New York City, and I don't know where you guys are, if this is on the books legally or not, and where the listeners are, are coming in from, but it's now something where you really have to prove a case why you need to be checking credit for someone it's not just a given that you can do that when i first started recruiting in 2006 2007 i sat down at the interview and would give them a background check form to fill out before they'd even gotten a job and part of it was like you know that you would like just so you know that we might have to run this at some point so let's get the form now and that was just kind of the culture of recruiting um and that organizations felt they were entitled to that information um and so what I've seen overall, and, and you guys tell me if you've seen this as well, I've seen a lot of backlash on the candidate end. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, and by backlash, yes. I just mean pushback, you know, yes. that they are questioning that process and saying, yes. hey, we don't we don't think that that's necessarily right. Why are we doing that? I see that in forums all the time. And which, by the way, ladies, did you see me? I tried to help uh, put up your jaw, mm-hmm. Julia, because you were like, oh, my, like <laughs> your jaw hit the floor for I, sure. I know. Um, But, you know, I'm curious with this, Dana, because with a lot of companies, nonprofits included, hiring remote from different places, right? The employee is working in different states, right? Mm -hmm. Like, do we need to be abreast of the hiring state of of the employer or the employee? Which do we fall upon? Um, I think so. Yeah. Th- when you go in to do a background check, you can do both a statewide check and you can choose which which state you want to run their background on. You mm-hmm. can also do a national check. So mm-hmm. let's say you're hiring out of an organization in New York, but the person is going to be working in California. I see it like you're saying all the time. Right. I would say you could run a state check if they've lived most of their adult life in California. I would run it for California. Okay. You can also spring for the national check, which is going to be more expensive when you go on the site. Like, cause we've and not just at Staffing Boutique, at every agency I've worked for, you have a membership to a background check company and you go in, the recruiter is responsible for going in and filling out that information and actually running the check on the, on the candidate. Um, and so I've done it many times. So what you could do is do a national check. It's going to take a little bit longer. They have to go through all 50 States, um, right. but it is a more thorough check. Um, you're really just looking for major like warrants is there anything outstanding have they been accused or convicted of any sort of felonies i mean that's basically what you're looking for but even that i'm saying that and i feel guilty even saying it because does a felony preclude you from being able to get employment you know so it's we're kind of flipping over all of these paradigms right now um or it has passed a lot of people you know felons can now vote again you know so it's Mm -hmm. it's a different world now Well, and there's a lot of companies that are hiring second chance employees, right? And they are second chance employers. Mm -hmm. Um, And so really looking at, okay, what are, what are the backgrounds that we will consider? We cannot consider some of this might, might be related to, you know, the funding parameters, um, you know, whether it's a federal funding and and things like that. So really there's just so many options and I don't know about you, Julia, but I'm so grateful I'm not in HR or in hiring oh. because there's a lot of I's to dot and T's to cross. I think that every time I have the staffing boutique ladies on, I'm always like, whew, <laughs> Dana, but before we go forward, can you give us an idea of what it costs to, to have these background checks conducted? 
Um, if you have a membership, and by membership, I just mean that you are an ongoing client of one of these yeah. um, these large companies that that basically sell these checks, you could get a national check for like maybe under fifty dollars. Oh, um, okay, the, the, the statewide check can be very very inexpensive. Um, now that's in bulk. I you know I can't quote their complete pricing, but as a one time. Um, as an organization, especially as a nonprofit, you also could probably negotiate a rate that's better than for a corporate entity that's using these types of sites. There might even be some government agencies. You know, I work technically on the for-profit side, and, and sometimes I even forget that. So yeah. if you're working directly for a nonprofit, there may be some government agencies that help subsidize this for you. Um, certainly, I would talk to, you know, the marketing rep or your sort of like CSR for those um, background check companies and see what kind of deal they can cut you. Because um, if it's a small place, a small organization, you're probably not doing background checks that often. Um, staffing agencies like ours are doing dozens. So, you know, the rate is a little bit better. But um, I, I would say for like some of the smaller checks, like a social security um, trace or a statewide check, it could be under like $20 or wow. even cheaper. For a full national check, it could be, you know. But there are some that are very, very detailed. I mean, you could, if you chose to run something very detailed on someone you can do three or four different checks and very quickly on one candidate it can turn into two hundred dollars so um it's also i think about getting with your team having somebody who is an hr expert or somebody who's a consultant that you're able to call that is an expert on hr law so whether you have general counsel within your organization or, or have a person on the board maybe that is able to speak to that expertise and coming up with a plan of like here is how we are vetting candidates going forward right. and so this is what we can afford. This is what the cost is. This is our liability. How do we, you know, navigate deciding what checks on this this website right. that we're going to be doing as a and I think keeping it consistent between mm -hmm. candidates because if one finds out that they were, you know, had a background check and then the other finds out that they didn't have to have one, that could cause friction too. So do you have to streamline it so everybody has the same? All of those things I think yeah. it's helpful for an organization to sit down and decide and then start the hiring process. So then let's move on to the next thing, because this kind of tags into it, you know, and I, sure. I love you saying, you know, that we need to have a, an understanding and a policy and what, what we're going to take and what we're not. Drug testing is a big part of this, because depending on your insurance, depending on if you have federal grants, there are a lot of things in place in the nonprofit sector that um, don't allow us, in essence, much leeway when it comes to recreational marijuana, um, understanding, you know, if we're going to disclose what types of drugs um, or pharmaceuticals our, our employees are on versus our clients. This is a huge, huge topic that I feel like we're almost in the middle of that it hasn't, it, that it's changing. And I'm wondering if you could talk to us about that. It absolutely is a living, breathing uh, entity that is changing and morphing all the time. As Every state is grappling with recreational drug use and legalizing, particularly marijuana. I, I've had drug testing be done on candidates in years past. Um, you know, something comes up positive, and usually it is a recreational drug that isn't viewed as that bad. So, like marijuana, for example. And I, I've had it, you know, make you know a job offer disappear. I've had clients say. Actually, of all the, you know, we actually don't worry so much about that. We're looking for other drugs. So I think it depends on what type of organization it is. Obviously, hospitals, possibly higher ed, some of the older, um, more like sensitive direct service organizations that have bigger liabilities. You know, I think sometimes the amount of checks we have to do are directly proportional to how much liability you have. So certainly a hospital where you are servicing children the elderly, vulnerable populations. Um, there's so many legalities. There's so many ways that, you know, you could end up in litigation um, by surfacing patients. You would have to drug test everybody and make sure that they've had a very extensive background check. There's kind of no way around it. I do not know legally how marijuana being legal in so many states affects that. So if you have somebody working remotely somewhere, yeah. but you're in a state where something's not legal, I really don't know how you how you navigate that. I wish I had a better answer. I think it's a question for for somebody with a legal background, yeah. to be honest. And I don't even know. 
I don't even know if, 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 if we've gotten that far. I think we're just at the phase where people are pushing for um, yeah. legalizing drugs and, and, and it's now trickling down even to the hiring process and we're all kind of playing catch up. Um, but is that, could that be viewed as, as, you know, discriminatory? If, yeah. if I'm in a state where something's legal and you're telling me that it's yeah. a problem for it to even be in my system, you could, I mean, does that leave the organization open to um, litigation? You know, I, I really don't know. And I hate to advise people a certain way other than to say, have you thought about these issues? And if you've thought about them, how, how have you, you know, worked on sealing up that li liability that may be open um, as you're screening people? I think it's probably a bigger issue for like line associates. So meaning like people who are doing like customer service, administrative support, where there's a lot of people doing the same job. I think for like leadership positions, you know, like director level C-suite people, I don't think this issue is as much of a problem because they probably will have vetted you so carefully prior to that, that getting into the drug testing and the background checks will probably just be sort of the final piece and i think that they would be able to work around any issues i think in general though when you're looking at like i have to hire 20 you know customer service reps for this program that's coming out i want to make sure they're only going to work for the summer but they're going to work for our organization and they're going to come in contact with our constituents how do i make sure that they are vetted clear free from any like drug use Am I in a state that's legal? Like all of those questions I think are, are are tricky. And so I wish I had better answers, but I will say, I think even just bringing it up and if there's listeners who are, are thinking about those types of things, just if you haven't thought about it to start thinking about it, I think is helpful. And I think you must include your risk assessment in there because a lot of, I mean, uh, driving vehicles, operating equipment, you know, on your campus, off your campus, um, your insurance will change and and they and they might have their own st structures whether it's legal in your in your state or not mm -hmm. and so yeah i think you're right it's a big big issue and it's continuing to plague a lot of folks even on the federal contract uh, basis too i mean oh wow so i mean for grants so i mean it, it's a big big topic and um something you're right dana we need to be aware of and really understand I don't have, we don't have much time and I'm, I love this question because I think you're in the thick of it and um, I'm really interested to find out what goes on with personal references. I mean, give us the, the dirty, the spill dirty the tea. Yeah, yeah, spill the tea because what, what's, what's up with this? I mean, I, to be perfectly candid, I have never, and I continue to feel this way have felt that personal references are of very much value now i know that's controversial oh. i know that every hiring manager that i talk to wants two and three references and they will not hire without it and i am happy to follow their lead on them i cannot imagine giving a reference to anybody who wasn't going to say nice things about me so we're talking about personal references where somebody's going to call a previous manager of yours or if you're a manager a previous subordinate of yours that presumably you are close with and have stayed in contact with right. and um and they're going to speak to them about your their experience with you i just think there's so many factors that can make it's their impression of working with you mm -hmm. and what i found in speaking with people over like 20 years of recruiting there's one side of the story there's the other side and then there's the truth that's like in the middle like i'll <laughs> talk to a candidate about something that i've been told they did and they will have an absolutely different story that completely paints it in a different light that they were completely justified in doing what they did. Mm -hmm. And the client will call me and tell me like a list of horror stories about what this person did. And then when I talk to them or sometimes bring them together, or you know, act as an intermediary, it's like the truth is definitely in the center. So like to me talking to a reference, they're either going to give me a glowing reference that is out of loyalty to a person that they like, and therefore doesn't really give you any concrete information or is going to be, could be considered slanderous if they're telling you negative things because it's their version of things yeah. um, and how it affected them. And and I think sometimes people can be um, sensitive about, oh, so-and-so, you know, worked with me and they, you know, we didn't get along or what have you. Like, did you just disagree? Did they just say things that you didn't want to hear or were they actually difficult to manage or rude or what, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. 
I find that a difficult way to siphon through. So to me, asking for somebody's references is just asking them for three people that they have enlisted loyalty from. Right. Is essentially right. what you're getting. Now, is no. that a good thing? Maybe, maybe that is a good thing, but I've never hired anybody and like placed them and the references was what made them a good fit for the job. Yeah. Let's put it that way. So sadly, our time is coming to a close, but you shared a statement with us in the green room chatter. If someone does reach out to us for a reference and we're not too keen on that person and not quite like, you know, as I was raised, you know, if you don't have any nice to say, don't say anything okay. at all. <laughs> what is that statement as, as we wrap up today's show? I, what I have said in the past is thank you so much for reaching out to me. I think that this particular person listed me as a reference, but I think that there are other people who could be a better reference for them. And so I wouldn't, I'm going to encourage them to yeah. find somebody else to speak for you to speak with. So if you could relay that to them or I can shoot, I'm happy to shoot them an email and let them know, Hey, like I'm probably not the best person to use as a reference. I'd rather that than get into a situation where I am, I, I'm doing what I just said people do, which is right. giving their version of things. And it may paint somebody in a negative light unfairly. Well, and that's a very professional statement, right? It's just, I don't think I'm the best person to provide this reference. And I encourage you, you know, to, to find another reference for yeah. this candidate. Dana, yeah. as always, amazing. Thank you. Yeah. We could talk to you forever. I feel like, you know, yeah. even the three topics we talked about today, yeah. you know, uh, the background checks, the drug testing, as well as the references could be broken down into their own individual episodes. Yeah. yeah. So I do too. I think it's riveting. And, and uh, you know, I, I feel, and Jarrett and I have talked about this offline, but I feel like when we can get staffing boutique when we chat with you, I feel like we get um, ahead of a whole um, arc of information before, as the marketplace is changing, because I feel like you're on the front lines of it. So you all yeah. see things kind of like maybe before it's being reported out or, you know, all these mm. issues. So for me, when I get to, to hear your, your voices, I'm just like, wow, it's a real insider's view. And so thank you. Dana Skurlock, Director of Recruitment for Staffing Boutique. Check out staffingboutique.org. You know, they do national work in our sector, in the nonprofit sector. And, and what an incredible thing because it is such a different type of business. And so, again, Dana, thank you. Um, you get to hear from somebody from Staffing Boutique um, every month. And it's, it's just a, a really, I think, invaluable. Whether you're actively searching or not, I just think for the health of your organization, it's a really important thing to, to hear and learn about. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. I've been joined today by the nonprofit nerd herself, Jared R. Ransom, CEO of the Raven Group. And again, we are here because we have amazing support from Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, fundraising academy at National University, staffing boutique, nonprofit nerd, and nonprofit tech talk. These are the folks that join us, as I like to say, day in and day out. Um, yeah, 850 shows was yesterday. Whew, Nelly. That's right. Amazing. I know. It's been a lot of fun. And, and we wouldn't be here if it weren't for our sponsors, yeah. uh, truly, all of our guests, and all of our viewers and listeners. So thank you for playing a part in this amazing journey. Yeah, absolutely. You know, every day as we end um, another wonderful episode of The Nonprofit Show, we leave everybody with this I call it a mantra, Jarrett, but it's all, it's like words to live by. I don't know what, but it's, yeah. it goes like this. And I really believe it. And it, it's a, our message is to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow.